When a murder baffles an entire town, it took a random man walking into the police department to uncover answers. Teenagers were the last suspects on anyone's radar until a secret affair was exposed. But many questions remain. What was the real motive? Was the victim's wife really involved? And why did a man have to die? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a 16 year old who killed his adult lover's husband. We really are diving into whether they would have done it without her or if she was completely uninvolved in the entire thing. If you don't know, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean, no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed with the post notification bell on and giving this video a thumbs up and leave me a nice comment down below. You can also follow me on my vlog channel on YouTube, Brooke McKenna Vlogs, or on my Instagram at Brooke McKenna underscore. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1990 in New Hampshire, and the Smart family lived in apartment 4E of the Summer Hill condominium in Derry. Now, this included 24-year-old Greg and his wife, 22-year-old Pamela. Now, Greg was an insurance salesman who worked with his father, and Pamela actually worked as the director of media services, as well as public relations for the local school district in Hampton and just kind of all around the area. There were about 12 of them that she worked with. Now, they had been together for about four years, and had met when Pamela had come back home to New Hampshire to see her family when Christmas break while she was away at college. Now at first Pamela was not really that interested in Greg and it took a little warming up for them to really get to know each other and then she ended up liking him enough to tell her family that he was the one. Now Pamela had grown up in a very normal family with a pilot as a father, a homemaker as a mother, and two siblings. They had been located in Miami, Florida before moving to New Hampshire but Pamela was actually a daddy's girl who would often go on flights with his father who was the pilot. She was known to be this happy, sweet girl and she ended up going to Florida State University and wanted to be a TV news reporter so she was majoring in communications. But at this time, she also wanted to be the next Barbara Walters. So she would host multiple radio shows to just kind of get her foot in the door and she was known as the Maiden of Metal because that is really the kind of music that she would play at all times. And it was strange, you know, it didn't really compliment her look but it was something she was very passionate about and this is what ultimately bonded her with Greg because Greg too liked that type of music. He had that rocker style, kind of like longer hair and he was outgoing and always smiling and he was said to be very gentle and polite. But once Greg met Pamela, he decided to go full force into it. He ended up moving from New Hampshire where they met all the way to Florida where Pamela was studying to be closer with her. He cut off everything he ever knew and he was going to be with the love of his life. He he was really serious about the future that he saw with Pamela. On May 7th of 1989, the 23 and 21 year old got married. Welcome for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Greg Smart. <laughs> And by this point, Pamela was graduating from college and they decided to move back to Derry, New Hampshire and get a house as well as a dog. They were ready to start their lives together and really just become the proper adults as far as most people's standards. But on May 1st of 1960, six days prior to what would have been their one year anniversary of their marriage, the police were called to their home. Now, Pamela was there when they arrived and she said that she had got home from work and she thought it was odd because all the lights in the house were off. Now, sometimes Greg did have meetings. They would go later into the night, but she believed he was going to be home that night and there were no lights on in the house. And so she ended up going inside and what she would find would cause her to run around and begin banging on all of the doors of her neighbors, screaming for help. Now, Wendy answered the door and Pamela told them that she needed help because her husband was passed out and others in this condominium were calling the police, not even speaking directly to her, but just because she was in such hysterics and they were worried that something horrible had happened. But Pamela was still really in her meltdown when the police were there and she was asking them repeatedly if there was a burglar inside. Officer Joe Skasha said that he responded first to this call about Greg Smart. He said that he was in the vicinity, he was the first to arrive at the scene, and when he got there, there was already about 15 to 20 people just kind of milling about because 
because the chaos had got them out of their homes. They were trying to figure out and see if there was any way that they could help. But Pamela actually wasn't the one to first speak to this officer when he arrived. It was the woman who had called the police for her and she also escorted Joe to this home. And inside where he found Greg Smart, basically right in front of the front door, lying on the ground. He was still wearing his work clothes. He was said to have one bullet to the back of the head and there was actually a towel wrapped around his head. And Officer Joe immediately noticed that he also had a bloody nose. EMTs arrived but then left after declaring Greg DOA, or dead on arrival, and a search was then conducted of the home for the safety of the officers at first to see if there was a burglar inside, but then also to try to collect different evidence. And what they found was that the whole home was a mess, that it appeared as though this had been a ransacked home, a burglary possibly gone wrong. And when they opened the cellar door, they saw that the Smart's dog was locked inside. Investigators were going to describe this as a gang-like execution. However, there were no connections to any gangs or illegal business or anything that really was violent about Greg Smart. There was no sign of forced entry either, and as far as burglary gone wrong, the home had been ransacked, but it was very odd that the main target Greg was not stolen from himself after they killed him. His wallet was still in his pocket. He still had his wedding band on and there were only thought to be a few things actually taken, which were pieces of Pamela's jewelry. Then a theory emerged that possibly Greg was addicted to gambling because there was a lot of casinos in Atlantic City where he would often go for business and they thought maybe he owed someone some money in Atlantic City. There were records showing that he did often call like casinos in the area, but again, they could have been for his business and they looked into it and really nothing was found that would have connected him to being in any sort of debt with anyone. The Derry Police Department were baffled with this case. This didn't happen in their town. Nothing happened in this town. No sort of crime and they were at a standstill. But six days later, they would not be. Because that is when Greg's wife, Pamela, would call the local news station and request an interview. She believed that she needed to go on air and plead for anybody who had seen anything to come forward. She believed that somebody at that apartment complex had seen what had occurred and she also wanted to talk about exactly who Greg was. I feel like in a whole condominium complex like ours, somebody must have seen or heard something everybody's saying they didn't hear or see anything and I keep thinking that I'll see him you know walk in but every day and every second that passes I realize that that won't happen and uh, yesterday I went out to the cemetery and that's kind of you know when it, when it really hit me that he won't ever come back you know it's awful to just think about what happened in there you know the only comfort I have is that you know it just seems to have been a situation where Greg didn't know what was happening and he just never knew, you know, and it was really quick. As she held the dog that she and Greg had adopted together, she showed the world this broken, widowed woman that she was. But Derry police had no answers to give her until a month and two weeks later, on June 10th, when a random man came into a police department with a gun. But this wasn't the Derry police department. This is actually the Seabrook, which was about 40 minutes away. And this man, this grown man, was saying that he kept his gun in his home and he went to get it one day and noticed that it was cleaned. He had not cleaned it. And he was questioning the family about it, kind of just telling them about it, when his teenage son's friend, who was also a teenager, began to tell him in a shocking statement that the gun had been used in a murder. The bullets were then tested and ballistics confirmed that it was the same gun that had killed Greg Smart. Now the teenage boy or the friend of this man's son was named Ralph Welch. He was located, arrested, and brought down to the station where Detective Barry Cherowitz interrogated him. Now Ralph began to say he wasn't involved with any of this, that he had just heard these plans being made, that the, the boy he was staying with and his friends had planned and executed this murder. He even said the name Greg Smart and said that he knew that they were going after this man, not just any random citizen. So I went in and he told me the story how it happened and who I was here. 
he told you the story about what about how what he happened. told me how they did it how they did what killed great Swan. he then gave them three names and that was bill flynn patrick randall and vance latami all teenagers. Billy was 16, Patrick was 17, and Vance was 17. And I believe that Ralph was about 17 to 18 as well. They were all still in high school at Winnicunit High School, and they were actually well known in the Seabrook community for being teenage criminals. They were in a lot of burglaries at this time. But Ralph Welch, once he got talking, he really didn't stop. And he not only knew the names, but he knew the whole story. He claimed that the teenagers drove to Greg's home where they threw his dog in the cellar to get it out of the way. And Billy Flynn shot Greg while Patrick held his head. Ralph said they were trying to make it look like it was in fact a burglary. But what he would say next would change everything. Broke into the place. And they set it up to make it look like a burglary. And I guess the guy tried to run or something. They grabbed him. They threw his dog in the cellar. Pete said he held the guy's head while Bill shot him. So Peter was the one that shot him? No. Pete said he held his head. Mm -hmm. Did he say how he held his head? No, he just said he held it and Bill pulled the trigger. Did they tell you anything else about it? This was beginning some insurance money or something. Mm -hmm. This is just what they said from Pam. Like, 500 or something and yeah say 500 dollars is that yeah. what pam was paying them or that's what they said she was gonna pay mm -hmm. and you're talking about pam who's pam the guy's wife okay pam smart yeah. did pam pay him anything else no uh, he just said something about insurance money or something he mentioned like 500 dollars a piece the finger hadn't been pointed at Pamela this entire time, until now. Because Ralph would begin to say that the only reason that his friends did this was because of a woman named Pam who told them that they would each get $500 from the insurance money. When Detective Sherwitz heard this, he asked him to confirm exactly who Pam was. And he said, Greg Smart's. Pamela did have an alibi though, because she had been at a school board meeting that night until around 10 p.m. when she finally would return home to find her husband. Her mother would come forward saying that Pamela had called her and was screaming to come over because Greg was dead. Pam called the house and she was hysterical and she screamed into the phone, Mom, come quick, Greg's dead. And inside I was trembling and I thought, well, maybe there's been an accident. When she arrived, her mother said that her clothes were soaking wet because she was crying so hysterically. To the public, she was a grieving wife. However, what the public didn't know was that the Dare police were very suspicious of her from the very beginning. You see, Pamela was known to be very emotional through, you know, finding Greg to his funeral anytime the cameras were kind of on her. However, a few hours after Greg was found, she was brought down to the police department for an interrogation and was completely emotionless. It was like her, her emotions just kind of switched off or she just stopped being emotional, which, you know, can be just because you are in shock. The trauma has just occurred and you are trying to find ways to deal with it. Your brain is just trying to work it out and it can cause you to seem unemotional. And so... They knew that this was not enough to blame her for the murder, but it did make them a bit more cautious of her. Investigators said though that she would also say things that wouldn't have been said if she wasn't there or didn't know what was happening. She would say things like that Greg did not know what was happening as it occurred. Like I said, they found it strange, but it wasn't enough to arrest her until the interview with Ralph Welch. But why would Pamela go to these teenagers as a hitman? Was it a cheaper price to pay for the death of her husband? What connected these individuals? And why did Pamela want her husband dead? And why would these kids agree to help with that? Well, it wasn't long before the investigators were able to piece it together because Billy, Patrick, and Vance all went to one of the schools that she worked for. In fact, Pamela worked specifically with Billy Flynn on a project that was outside of school, but it was 
basically an orange juice commercial where they could win a chance to be able to go to Disney World. And a whole bunch of students got together to do this project and Pamela was basically in charge. Pamela had met Billy and a whole bunch of these other students through a self-esteem class that all freshmen had to take, but some of the older students could go and help. And it was just basically to make sure that everybody was okay, that they weren't struggling with anything. And that's how she knew all of these people to kind of invite them to do this orange juice commercial. So she gathered a group of people who were willing to work after hours and Billy Flynn was the cameraman. Now this was the connection easily found between the emotionless wife and the named killers. However, there was also another connection that was much darker. But before we get into that, there was suspicion at Greg's funeral. There was a few teenage boys that nobody really knew and that they knew Greg didn't know who had showed up randomly and kind of just their presence made everybody a little bit uneasy. Pamela also walked out of the funeral with her dad holding her up like she couldn't even walk on her own, sobbing once again. She had appeared victim to the public in all of this prior to what they would later learn because it turned out she was attempting to be a phenomenal actor and was possibly the mastermind of murder. Now, what I didn't tell you about the interview that Pamela did that she'd set up herself with a news station was that she had randomly told the reporter that it was a good time in Greg's life for this to happen. You know, there's no better time in his life for this to happen. Because if they would have been married 20 years, she would have loved him even more. Now, this was an odd statement, but the oddities that the police were kind of just, you know, tallying up about Pamela would turn to suspicion and then to uncovering evil. Investigators did decide to arrest these boys at this point, and that is when the media actually went to Pamela's door and told her the news about, you know, her husband's killers being arrested, but she wasn't ecstatic. She wasn't, you know, emotional. She was almost angry, and she said she had no comment. Then a phone call came into the police department, and a woman on the other line was saying that they had somebody who had proof that their wife was involved in Greg Smart's murder. That is when a teenager named Cecilia would come forward and she would say that she was working on that orange juice commercial with everybody, with the boys and Pamela, but it wasn't that innocent. Now, what I'm about to tell you wasn't out of the blue either. You see, Pamela's mother claimed that Pamela had never been very social. She was always, you know, dedicated to school or work. She did not want to be around boys or even friends. However, her mother noticed that after getting a job at this school, Pamela had become very social, but not with coworkers or her husband or her neighbors, students, with underage students. She was constantly with these kids, even after hours, even when not working on these projects. But Cecilia knew that this was not innocent because Pamela was having an affair on her husband with a 15-year-old boy. Billy Flynn was her lover. What Billy didn't know was that he was the victim of grooming and sexual abuse, but to him, he was in love with an older woman. Cecilia would silence them all in shock when she said that she had walked in on the two sleeping together. It's okay, how was Pam? How did you find out about the affair? Pam told me that she was in love with Bill. And I was being behind the sex because I worked at home. The most important thing Cecilia had witnessed, though, was that she had overheard Pamela talking with Billy and Billy's friends about wanting Greg dead. At this point, the police decided to use Cecilia and get official proof. And so in a recording that Pamela had no idea about, Cecilia went undercover and told Pamela that they basically believed that Pamela was responsible for Greg's murder, that she had been called down to the station, that they were going to blame her. And at this point, Pamela didn't deny it at all. She didn't admit it. She didn't deny it. She she really just didn't break down at all. Pretty much, they, they established that, yeah, you had great help. <laughs> 
why though? And, like, you know, um, because they can't think of any other reason why they're on them with you. Yeah, but even if I ask you to kill somebody, you have to be deranged to say, okay, I will. You know what I mean? Whether someone asks you to or not. As far as I can see it, Bill did it because he loved you. In one of the many conversations recorded between the two, Cecilia captured Pamela say, I'm afraid one day you're going to come in here and you're going to be wired for the effing police and I'm going to be busted. Pamela also wanted to establish a signal with Cecilia in case she was wired to let her know. Um, and Cecilia basically got fed up with this and she told Pamela, look, I'm sick of lying. I'm sick of lying for you and what you did and, you know, say like, basically telling her, I know what you did, I can go to the police. And that's when Pamela switched from nice and concerned to threatening. And she told Cecilia, if you tell the truth, you're gonna be an accessory to murder. She told her that if they asked if she knew anything, she was gonna say no. If they asked if Pam did it, she was gonna say no. And that if she were to talk, they would send her to the slammer for the rest of her life. They finally had her on August 1st, which was three months since the murder. Now this day, Cecilia was asked to call Pamela while the police listened in and Cecilia got really mad at her over this call because Pamela was breaking down because she had hit a rabbit on her way to work. And Cecilia said, I can't believe you're upset over a rabbit and not Greg. And she said, oh, I'm upset over Greg too, but I can be upset over the rabbit. Now that day, Detective Pelletier drove to her work and she asked him what was up. And he said, well, Pam, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that we've solved the murder of your husband. The bad news is you're under arrest. She said, for what? And he said for second degree murder. She was then officially arrested. And they also had arrested another teenage boy in connection with the murder named Raymond Fowler, who was 18 years old. As soon as they got her in custody, the teenage boys who refused to say anything prior suddenly began to open up. They were willing to talk and they were willing to tell just how much Pamela was involved. Vance was the first one to talk and he was saying that Pamela had told them that Greg hit her all the time, didn't treat her right, and Pamela and Billy wanted to be together. He said that he even heard Pamela and Greg in a fight over the phone at one point and this kind of, you know, solidified in his mind, yeah, she's telling the truth, they are fighting, Greg is abusive. Billy then eventually told Vance and all of his friends, look, you can get some money if you help us with this. And Vance was actually the one to get the gun from his father, as well as the getaway car that was his grandmother's car that he would end up driving. So he was never actually in the home, but he sat out there with Raymond Fowler, who didn't go inside the home either. Now, Billy spoke up and he claimed that he was in love with this beautiful, intelligent, older woman and that every day she was asking him to help her get rid of Greg. Now, due to these statements and the overwhelming testimony against Pamela, a trial could begin. And the entire trial of Pamela Smart was presented on TV. She was considered the golden girl of true crime during this time. And all three boys who, you know, the youngest being 16, Billy was 16 at this point, agreed to testify for plea deals. So on March 5th of 1991, the trial began and the defense claimed that Billy Flynn killed Greg in a jealous rage, wanting Pamela to himself and possibly that Pamela had broken it off between the two of them and he did not want to let her go. That Pamela had nothing to do with this at all, but the prosecution claimed that Pamela had convinced Billy Flynn to get his friends to murder her husband for $140,000 in life insurance. Now, the Smart family's neighbor testified saying that he had seen Greg enter the home the night of his murder around 8 50 to 9 15 that evening and a little while later he heard a shuffle and a loud bang which he thought was a door being slammed now he didn't investigate and he did hear another bang come a little while later and it shook the wall it was so hard he thought that these bangs were just the doors being slammed he didn't want to be intrusive so he left it alone but around 10 p.m the doorbell rang there was banging yelling at the front door and it was such chaos that this husband told his family to get back and he like barricaded the door so that if somebody was trying to get in, they wouldn't be able to. 
They called the police, but they would not open the door. And finally his wife was like, maybe she needs help. Maybe we should go outside and let her in. And her husband was basically like, no, she's, she's going insane out there. He said it wasn't safe. But then a little while later, he too got curious. So he took an umbrella and he used that as his weapon of choice as he went outside. But by the time he got outside, Pamela was actually gone and the police were already next door. At this point, Pamela started screaming about needing to call Greg's parents. And so this man's wife said, well, give me the number and I will do it. And she ended up being the one to call them. Now, Patrick Randall, one of the teenage boys, testified in a very vacant state. That's how I would describe his lack of emotion. He admitted to wanting to be a professional hitman and he was living in a juvenile home facility before prison. He was one of the main boys that the investigators wanted for this crime because he was one who was in the home and actually helped in the murder of Greg Smart. He was also one of the main boys that the Seabrook investigators already knew for burglary. He said that they wore gloves inside the home and also taped up their fingertips to make sure they didn't leave any fingerprints. He was void of emotion, like I said, lacking remorse, and he said that Greg came home that day, that he called for his dog, only to be met with his killers. That Billy jumped out from behind the door and attacked him, and then they had planned on stabbing Greg, but that Pamela told them that it would get too much blood all over them, and so it was better just to shoot him. So instead, they used a gun. We sat around and waited for Greg Smart to get home. When Greg came into the door, he opened up the door and called to his dog. And Bill grabbed him and pulled him in the house. And he was screaming and trying to run out. At the time, I was just standing on the landing watching it all happen. And then I stepped around off the landing and around both of them, pushed Greg into the house and shut the door. Now, you grabbed him by the hair and banged his head up against the wall. Did you ever let go of his head? No, I did not. So as he got down on his knees, what were you doing? I was still holding by the hair with my left hand. And what were you doing with your right hand? I had a knife in it. And what were you doing with that knife that was in your right hand? I had it underneath his chin, well, in front of his face. And where was Bill standing at this time? To the right side and slightly behind him. What happened after that? Bill took the gun out and shot him. Now Vance Latamy, the one whose father brought in that gun, testified that Ralph Welch, who was, you know, the one who really uncovered the killers, knew everything about him because he was his friend for a very long time. He was actually living with them. I'm not sure really the reason why, but he had been living with them for many years. They were like his own family. So he knew about all of this. He had overheard all of this, not because they really told him, but because he was always there. So Vance explained that before they murdered anybody, Pamela was asking how she should react when she finds her husband dead and they told her to act normal. But the day that they took the gun from Vance's father, he handed it to Billy and he actually went in the other room to distract Ralph so Ralph wouldn't know what was happening. His father's gun ended up being used for the murder, but Vance didn't want it to be because he said that they couldn't just dispose of that evidence because his father would want to know where his gun went. However, he too said Pamela did not want them to use a knife because it would get blood on her white furniture. Vance said that he sat waiting in the car with Raymond Fowler as the murder occurred. Then Billy Flynn took the stand. Everybody was waiting for what he would say. He too was in a juvenile home facility before being arrested, just like Patrick. Now he appeared to be much more innocent than the others. He was only about a year younger than them, but he had a much more timid, quiet, personality than anybody else and he said that when he first met Pamela he was always trying to be in the same room as her he thought she was very beautiful and she asked at one point after you know them working on the project for a while if he wanted to come and see a picture of her with his favorite band they were both into you know the metal bands and she had gotten a picture with one of them and so they went to her office together this started happening pretty much every day billy said that at first they didn't spend their time completely alone there were always other students but three months prior to the murder they began meeting alone at the office and that's when Pamela asked Billy what he thought about her. 
because she thought about him all the time. All of the students working on this commercial then began to go to Billy's home to record it and sometimes it was just him and Pamela. One day they kissed after Pamela asked him if he was going to kiss her. They also spent the night together at Pamela's home while Greg was away. He told his mom every time he was away that he was at his friend Vance's house. He then described the night that Cecilia was talking about where all of these students were over watching a movie and then he and Pamela went upstairs and had sex. Okay, how did the first kiss come about? Well, we were laying on my bed, and uh, I just started talking about it. Uh, what do you mean you were talking about? Mm -hmm. She was saying, why didn't you kiss me? I said, yeah. She said, well, do I have to come to that major? I said, yeah, and I just kidding. And uh, just kiss. Well, after the movie was over, we went upstairs. Who went upstairs? And so. What happened after that? We had sex. He began saying that, you know, this was a full-blown relationship with himself and Pamela, and that Pamela was telling him the only way they could be together is if he killed Greg. She told him to do it when she had an alibi and that she would leave open the door to the basement. Billy then said that they parked in a shopping center behind the home, changed into dark clothes, and then they wore gloves like Pamela had told them to, and they were also allowed to ransack the place and take anything they wanted. When Billy started to have reservations, Pamela told him, don't waste my time if you're not going to do it. In a shocking statement, Billy told the courtroom that they had tried to kill Greg a month prior in April. However, he was already home, so they went back home, and then that is when Billy recruited more friends, saying they would get $500 each. He once told her he couldn't do it because he didn't have the gun or the car yet, and she snapped on him, telling him that he must not love her. This is when Billy began talking about the murder and he broke out in tears. He said that on the day of the murder, after school, he had to ask Pamela to drive them to where Vance's grandmother's car would be so that they could take it to the smart home. He said he put his hair into a ponytail. It was a bit longer. He put his hair into a ponytail so people couldn't describe him as easily. And he said that once Greg came home and they attacked, Greg wasn't even really fighting back. He was just wondering what was going on. And Bill said that as he held out the gun, he said, God, forgive me. And then he pulled the trigger. All right. I took the gun out of my pocket and I, um, I cocked the hammer back and um, I pointed the gun at his head. After you pointed the gun at his head, what'd you do? I just stood there. How long was it? Um, a hundred years, it seemed like. And, um, I said, um, God, forgive me. After you said, God, forgive me, what happened? I pulled the trigger. He said he would never would have done it if Pamela didn't ask him to, that she was the first girl he ever loved and that he was a virgin before her. He then said she picked him up from the murder, drove him back to Seabrook, and then went on to her school meeting, which was her alibi, which is why she got home at 10 p.m. that night. Billy also said that once Vance's father found that the gun was cleaned and Ralph told him what had happened and threatened to go to the police, that Patrick and Vance came to him and they were saying, you know, we need to try to get the gun away from my father and from that home, but it was too late because they were arrested the next day. JR and uh, Pete were saying, you know, listen, we gotta talk to you. Ralph's flipped out, he's gonna go to the police. Uh, Pete told him everything. After that, um, all right, we got into Pam's car and we drove to Seabrook. We told her, um, you know, the cops can be looking for us right now, you know, we don't know what to do. And she said, well, then get out of the car because I don't want anything to do with you if, you know, the cops are coming. Your big fear is that Pam would break off a relationship with you? <coughs> if I didn't kill Greg, yes. That's it? I didn't want her to leave me. Did you want to be with her the rest of your life? Yes, I did. Okay, when did that start? When was that desire? Um, 
Probably the, after the first time we had sex. Then Pamela took the stand herself. Pamela and She Mark. was emotionless, but she was very loud and outspoken, and you could tell she was much more confident, more mature than the boys. But she did wear big bows in her hair to make herself appear younger. Pamela would say that Greg was the first one to cheat, that he went out with his friends one night, did not come home. He said he was at a friend's home, but he finally admitted to meeting someone when they were out and sleeping with her. Pamela said that she was mad and that basically she didn't let it go for a while, but said that she wanted to make things work and that this occurred way before she ever cheated with Billy. While being with Billy, she had told Greg that she didn't think that she wanted to be with him anymore and he started crying, but she also said she didn't want a divorce either. She also spoke of a time where she was in an argument with Greg while he was drunk and he hit her, but that he never beat her and he was very upset with himself once he realized what he had done when he sobered up. Pamela said that the relationship started between her and Billy because Cecilia had told her that Billy liked her. And she claimed that at first, she told Billy she liked him too, but she was married and couldn't be doing this with him. But eventually she grew feelings for him. She then admitted to having a affair with an underage boy and saying that she loved him. But she also said that Billy only killed Greg because she told him she wanted to repair the marriage and wanted to break it off with Billy. She said that that Friday before Greg was murdered, she had told Greg about the affair and that she was breaking it off. It was no longer an issue. And then she went to tell Billy, who she said told her he was going to kill himself. Well, I didn't set out to have an affair with him, but I did. Well, I was over his house, we were working on the video. We were in his room and he kissed me. Did you bite him off? Excuse me? Did you bite him off? No. Yes, I wanted him to come over. Did you expect that when he was over, you would have sex with him? Yes. Did you have sex with him when he came over? Yes. Did you watch that movie Nine and a Half Weeks? Yes. Did you make love to him? Yes. Do the thing with the ice cubes? No. I, I just realized that obviously it, I couldn't have two relationships at once and that it was going to have to be one or the other. And I, I wanted to be with Greg. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't you just get a divorce? Because I didn't want a divorce. What was Billy Flynn's reactions on the times when you tell him the things you told us earlier about him being wrong and wanting having to break it off? <clears throat> He's. He told me that he was going to kill himself. Did you plot the death of your husband? Check from your honor. No. Were there any discussions about murdering your husband on the right? No, there were not. Did Bill Flynn show you a pistol or gun, any kind of gun on the way to him? No. She denied having any involvement in the murder whatsoever. And when asked why she didn't just get a divorce, she said she didn't want a divorce. Cecilia then testified that Pamela had told her that she did love Billy. I'll say you, is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the offense charge? Guilty. <laughs> Let me see it, right? After 13 hours of deliberation, Pamela Smart was found guilty of accomplice to first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and tampering with a witness who was Cecilia. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I hereby sentence you to the New Hampshire State Prison for Women for the remainder of your life without the possibility of parole. Greg's family immediately went to his grave and told him that it was finally over, that she was in jail. Pamela was sent to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, which is a maximum security prison, but she was transferred out of there and it was found that she had 22 disciplinary reports for minor offenses. As far as the boys, Vance Latamy, the getaway driver, received 15 years for being an accomplice to second degree murder, while Patrick Randall and Billy Flynn received 25 years for second degree murder. Now, Raymond Fowler only received 12 years for conspiracy to murder and attempted burglary. He was said to have not understood what was going on. He was kind of a last minute ad. He was in the car. He thought that they were robbing the place. He had no idea this had anything to do with a murder. 
allegedly. But two years later in 1993, Vance, Patrick, and Billy and their parents fought a lawsuit against the Winnicunit School District for their negligence in hiring and supervising Pamela that resulted in inappropriate relationships and dangerous effects. The school actually turned to the National Union to defend and pay for this lawsuit, basically. However, they declined to pay anything, saying that it was a claim involving criminal acts and imprisonment, which basically made it so they didn't have to do anything. They said that the boys and their parents even listed the reasons for the lawsuit as being the effects of their lives ruined due to the murder and imprisonment, which further just, you know, made everything seem like it was due to just the murder and not the abuse at the hands of Pamela before the murder. So this entire thing was dismissed. However, Cecilia Pierce, in a different lawsuit, went after the school for the training and supervising of Pamela. And then it caused her a loss of education, a loss of past, present, and future earnings, a loss of reputation and standing in the community, and mental anguish. And she ended up winning $9,000 in her settlement. This was said to be because she was not involved in the murder and that it actually affected her in other ways. Now, Diane Sawyer did do an interview with Pamela as well as Billy Flynn while they were in prison. And she had Billy ask a question to Pamela, which she showed Pamela in her prison interview. And when Diane said, you know, Billy has a question for you, Pamela said, oh, I think I know what it is. And she was exactly right because he was asking her if she really did love him. And she said she did. Pamela did admit in an interview later that her lawyer had told her that Cecilia was wired, that she was working with the police and that every time that she came to her, basically she was trying to get information and yet Pamela still talked enough to get herself arrested, which doesn't really make sense. Now, Raymond was released in 2003, but violated his parole and was sent back to prison. That same year though, Pamela had photos published in a newspaper from inside prison that were a little risky. And she filed a complaint against the prison for this and was put in solitary confinement for going against them. She said that they were taken by a prison guard that sexually assaulted her, but it was dismissed. The next year though, she sued officials once again at the prison for harassment and assault. And at this time, she ended up winning 23,875 before her legal fees. Pamela began to say at this point that she would have rather gotten death than have to grow old and die in prison that way. Vance was released in 2005 and Raymond was re-released that year. And Patrick and Billy were released in 2015 on the same exact day. As far as Billy though, he had fought for a shorter sentence and even made a statement apologizing to Greg's family and asking for forgiveness. He had said, I will always feel terrible about what happened 25 years ago. Parole will not change that. I know that nothing I can say here today will be of comfort to the Smart family, but at the very least, I sincerely hope that this will be the last time they have to be publicly reminded of their grief and I am truly sorry for the pain I have caused them. Greg's brother spoke to Billy and he was very angry, saying that he did not deserve mercy. And I got an answer for you, Flynn. And it's the same answer that you, William Flynn, gave my brother Gregory Smart 17 years ago as he begged for mercy. And that answer is bang! No! Another member of Greg spoke up saying that she hoped that he would at least have to serve his 28 year minimum, but she prays that he does good things if he is released. He was released in March of 2015 on his 41st birthday, and he moved to Maine with the wife that he had married in prison. She actually had a daughter and her daughter said, I will not be living with you if Billy comes and lives with you, which he did. While in prison, Billy had received his GED and an electrician helper license while inside. And a year prior to his release, he was participating in a work release program. So it was a pretty easy switch back to reality for him. Raymond Fowler, you know, the first man to be released, the one who was thought to have the least to do with this murder, and his brother said that they don't believe that Billy should have actually been paroled because he took down a lot of people with his decisions. That they actually believe the same as Pamela's mother, that Pamela was not the mastermind and that it was actually Billy and he was not as innocent as he portrayed himself to be. They also believe that if Patrick wasn't with Billy, Billy would have chickened out and that Patrick was the deciding factor in the actual 
murder. Vance's father asked for his gun back eventually, but was denied in order to preserve the evidence due to the many, many, many appeals that Pamela and others could ask for. But Cecilia Pierce decided to speak out once again in 2016, and she said that all those years ago, before all of this, she'd wanted to be a reporter. And that's initially why she began working on this orange juice commercial. She was basically using Pamela as a mentor but now she wishes that she would have never met her even though they became good friends. She said when she first told an adult about this murder plot she had heard was happening between Pamela and the boys, they didn't believe her. She says though that if Pamela could just be honest about what she did and her part in this, that she would feel like she's spent enough time in prison at this point and should be released. She now believes that Pamela wanted a divorce from Greg and was afraid he would take everything, so this is the only way she thought. But Cecilia now works as a nurse and she ended up getting a $10,000 movie deal out of this. She said though she does not want to be a reporter after the trial that she went through because she was chased across the courthouse lawn during Pamela's trial and she was reading things in the newspaper like Pamela couldn't do it, she's hot and it just made her lose faith in the system. Now, of course, Pamela's mother does not believe that she's guilty. She does not believe she even had a fair trial due to the media. Now, this is something we hear many times that the media has caused these trials to basically make it hard for the juries to find the truth and that they are wrongfully convicted due to what the media has already convicted them of. And the prosecutor of her trial even says that he doesn't know that somebody should be in jail for the rest of her life and if that's fair. She was beaten in prison by two inmates who believe that she was a snitch and she now has a metal plate behind her eye and she is a good prisoner. She is in the ministry, she educates other inmates, and she's an overall just decent human while in Inside. After the attack, though, her counselor said that she is much more suicidal and that she has many dark days. Pamela has said, though, that she actually keeps track of where Billy is, what he's doing, because she believes that if he will tell the truth, it will set her free. She has tried many appeals, but in her statement, she will refuse to take any responsibility for the murder, and she continues to claim that Billy killed him and she didn't ask him to. Because of this, they're denied every time. And Pamela Smart's counselor, who is Dr. Eleanor Pam, has said, how can a self-confessed killer like Flynn perjure himself, blame Pamela Smart for his own actions, and then receive the benefits of freedom and a reclaimed life? How can he be rewarded while she is endlessly punished, incarcerated for the rest of her natural life? It's a question many people had. Why is the person who pulled the trigger out while the person who, yes, was maybe the mastermind but wasn't even at the crime scene still remains in prison. But we will get into that in a moment because in 2019, she did a prison interview with ABC where she said that she would never admit to the murder because she doesn't believe that a person innocent of a crime should confess to a crime that they didn't commit. She said she's been called a black widow, the ice princess, but none of it is true. And Pamela has been said to exhaust all of her appeal options. The last one was not too long ago, in the last year, and she finally did admit a little bit of blame. She said, I offer no excuses for my action and behavior. I'm to blame. I regret that it took me so long to apologize to the Smart family, my own family, and everyone else. But I think that I wasn't at a place where I was willing to own that or face that. I was young and selfish and I wasn't thinking about the consequences of what I was doing. Now hearing this, the Attorney General just heard that she had been lying for the past 30 years and said that just because she decides to change this now doesn't mean she truly changed, especially because it wasn't a full confession. She has never said the words, I am involved in my husband's murder or anything like it. It's always skirting around the truth. Does this make you believe she is a innocent woman who does not want to say that she's guilty of something she's not? Or is she a prideful killer who refuses to take the blame? Many people were telling her, you know, you could get a chance 
at being released if you just admit what you did and she still refused to do so. Pamela Smart remains in prison today and there was a movie called To Die For that was skyrocketing this case to even more fame with Nicole Kidman in it and they play it in the prison where Pamela is held and she has said that it's completely inaccurate. But do you think that Pamela should be released if everyone else involved in the actual murder in this case is? It's, it's a hard thing to face that these teenagers could have done this all on their own we do know that children can be evil, teenagers can be evil, they can be killers. That is not something that is out of the realm of possibility and they did shoot a man in cold blood here. But at the same time, this case appears to be murder due to manipulation and grooming and also a whole other crime of sexually assaulting a minor. Yet neither side were completely innocent of that murder and so should they have been released early due to the fact that they were just much younger when it occurred? Do you believe what Pamela said at her last hearing was a confession or was it simply a way to hopefully gather sympathy in hopes of being released? Do you think Pamela should be released? I understand what people are saying about how the ones who actually pulled the trigger have been long out of jail and she just sits there even though she got somebody else to kill someone or is completely innocent entirely, if you believe that. So I see what people are saying and you know, a lot of people say it's due to the fact that these are men that were released and she's a woman and that a lot of women spend a longer amount of time behind bars. But I don't know. I, I also understand why she would be given a longer sentence and would be kept in there longer because she did manipulate and groom and possibly force these children into becoming killers. Was Pamela involved in her husband's death? If anything, answer that question for me. What do you think? Just divorce. Money doesn't matter as much as your freedom. Just divorce, get more things in the future. The fact that she got a 15, 16 year old boy, because he was 15 when they started dating, to, to hate her husband so much or to, to feel like he had to save her by killing him is insane. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.